Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a special interview with uh, me, D. Amanda Hagen, and... Me, the Omega. What? Yep. We are interviewing award-winning British filmmaker, Stuart Urban. Hello. Now, uh, people who have watched my show uh, will have come across Mr. Urban's work, whether you realize it or not, because he directed Preaching to the Perverted, one of the movies I reviewed in my third season, I believe. Yeah, and, what was your third season? And uh, personally, one of my uh, preferred films from third series. Really, really enjoyed the film. So where did you get the idea for doing a BDSM romantic comedy? Well, as I said once in an interview uh, at, at Cannes, actually, it wasn't at Cannes, it was in the market, I said to a, a film journalist, well, it's, of course, an adaptation of Jane Austen's unknown novel, Perversion. And this bloke took down, he wrote down, you know, like, perversion. And um, he, I was actually going to publish it, I think. He was a very young journalist, and, and uh, I, I had suggested that Jane Austen's undiscovered work was the, was the inspiration, and he nearly, he, well, he did swallow it. No, it wasn't. Um, it was, in fact, the, the prosecution of fetish clubs and some pretty heavy BDSMers, as they call them, who had uh, done things which were so scandalous that they, the government and police felt that a criminal prosecution and jail sentence was the only reaction uh, because these guys had sent their videos through the post. And I just thought, well, I mean, it's just, just nuts, these people who harm only themselves, if you can call it harm. I mean, it wasn't permanent harm, but it was quite graphic. I mean, quite intense. Um, this is this is nuts that they're being prosecuted. So I went to a couple of the trials, and of course went to the fetish clubs um, to see what the fuss was about. And I came out, I came out kind of dazed, like like a sort of cartoon uh, figure with my eyes out on stalks, and, and and was in a sort of daze for two weeks, kind of wanting to go up to people on street corners and say, "Do you realise that there is this incredible world, the, the fetish clubs?" Uh, and all these things go on there, and it's it's just... I felt a bit like Peter, actually, in the film, the character who, who wanders into the world as, a, as an infiltrator. Well, as of one day, he targets the world. But, um, you know, I, I was only infiltrating for the purpose of having an amusing time and, and seeing what was actually going on there that was... What was all the fuss about, you know? So did you, uh, did you dress up for the part, or did you just go um, as yourself, or did you, like go and drag like Ricky Tomlinson in preaching or? Well, you know, you can't, you've got to respect their dress code or <laughs> you won't get in basically. So I had to think of something that didn't look too comical. And uh, so I went with my wife as Soviet officers because we had got these uniforms out of the Soviet Union just after its collapse or rather it was Russia by then. And they were fantastic outfits, which were like KGB. She was KGB and I was a tank colonel I think or major um, and uh, actually when I was there with quite a well-known actor from the bill um, there was we we were sort of outed or I did I mean he was he had a full piece about him because there was an entrapment piece in News of the World about Jeff Stewart who used to pay PC Hollis for any of your fans of the bill and uh, I was described as a, a known director in a Nazi uniform and the only thing that really upset me was that I was described as being a Nazi you know which was really insulting and isn't really done like those you don't really go around as far I don't remember seeing people with swastikas on but but maybe they were Yeah, slightly different group it really seems. Yeah, but not to the news of the world. So anyway it was quite funny. That's what I've been into. <laughs> yes, it must have been that itself would make a really, really interesting film project itself, just, you know, dramatizing that. <laughs> yes. Poor Jeff. He got, I think he was sort of suspended from the bill for a while for, for moral turpitude, you know. Uh, I think he'd ended up trying to spank the, the infiltrator from the News of the World. It was exactly like a story from, from Preaching to the Perverted or indeed the later Leveson inquiry uh, scandals. Uh, it was, was, you know, kind of straight out of that world, but some years before that was, you know, um, known what was going on. One thing I noticed um, after rewatching Preaching to the Perverted, um, in the years since it was made, and since I'd first seen it, and then uh, till I did the review, the 
some elements of the of it had actually come come to pass, such as you know the criminalization of uh, you know consensual uh, violent porn in the UK. It's there's a lot of ongoing issues. I think I, I'm not up on exactly the current uh, state of the law, but but uh, yes, I mean I mean well certainly in Iceland, I think you'd be in trouble for watching preaching to the perverted, uh, liberal Iceland, where you know any anything any. Uh, film or any content which mixes uh, sex and uh, well you could call it violence I mean you know it's just people hurting themselves consensually um, is liable to banning or blocking and criminal prosecution you know you I'm not supposed to inject myself into the conversation you know because you know as an impartial interviewer but that's ridiculous I just think that's fascinating because I'm you know as an American People really don't care that much. I mean, people pretend to care, like, it's terrible, won't someone think of the children? But porn is such a big industry around here, and, you know... Yeah, I mean, uh, so, yeah, it, it, in essence, that is coming full circle, yes, and things like that are going on. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure the latest piece of law is quite fluid. Of course, how they'll patrol or police it in the age of, you know... Uh, IP tunnels and virtual private networks and all that. Yeah, it does seem difficult. It's a little bit like um, King Canute and the <laughs> and the sea. Yeah, yeah. In this case, the waves are the internet, um, the freedom of the internet, which which uh, you know can, can work both for good or bad. But you know, certainly towards liberty or you know libertarianism, whatever you want to call it. Last question on preaching to the verdict before we go into your other works. How did you get involved with um, with Guinevere Turner? How did she get into into the project? Because her career has been fascinating. Yes, she sent me a video uh, offering to spank someone for me. <laughs> That's what she did. That's Unfortunately, a... it is lost for all time. It would have made the ideal DVD extra, but some bastard walked off with it, I think. I don't know what happened, but it was a classic video. And um, she said, you know, uh, hello, I, I'm Gwyn, I've heard about your film, and I'd like to spank someone for you. And then just read a scene, of course. She had, uh, somehow, I think I think her agent had got her the, the lines, you know, so she read the site, she did a good performance. And I think it was shot by uh, Rose Troche, who directed Go Fish, uh, her former partner, you know, in the film they made together, I think so. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great little video. Yeah. And now she's. Uh... I mean, I, sorry, I should add that I, I, she was so good in the video. I went to meet her in New York, and and um, uh, that was, you know, we, went, we had a meal. Uh, she offered during the meal to have live sex with whoever played Peter. I kind of choked on my <laughs> pierogi, whatever I was eating. I think it was a Polish place, so I I, I spluttered and said I, I don't think that will be necessary, but. but um, yeah, she, she she did say something like, you know, I'll really fuck the guy if you want. But um, it would have been too difficult, you know. Yeah, you're I, not quite Larry Clark. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's that kind of thing when you make a film. Uh, I have fired live ammunition on a film, outgoing real tracer fire, but that was because we were in a remote place. But there's certain walls that, you know, if you break or lines that you cross that I think for your actors are unfair, you know. So I, I don't think I do the the uh, nine songs of Michael Winterbottom thing. Probably not. It's not because I have a kind of moral objection. I just think you, you get into a bit of a mess, you know, and, and it, it sort of gets in the way of what you're trying to tell the audience in the story. I mean, I say that, but, you know, of course, I, there were things in Preaching to the Perverted that I would have probably done stronger or got away with, I hope, if we do uh, a sequel or something that I could do. But... Given that, you know, full sex um, is difficult, especially if um, one side is not heterosexual and you're portraying a heterosexual relationship, it's quite, it's quite difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, I decided not to try to, uh, you know, uh, call her in on that one. Um, but yes, especially uh, because, you know, this is just as a viewer, but it seemed that everything that wasn't directly connected to BDSM was very 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 traditionally made it was a very traditional romantic comedy the story and live sex probably would have interfered with that a little bit yeah i think um what i'd say there is that it's a fairy tale the film and therefore i wasn't interested 
uh, in, you know, sort of British social realism, let's have them having real sex. I was interested in portraying an outrageous sort of fairy tale. Uh, hence, the film ends with, with a, a nursery rhyme that, you know, some could consider outrageous and others said is a, is a cop-out, you know, where, where the, the, as a result of this very unusual liaison, the, the man, you know, a Christian fundamentalist, is carrying around a baby in a domination parlour and singing a rather a very real but very dodgy song from the Victorian era to the baby. <laughs> well, like I said in my review, I would love to see some sort of a thing involving that baby growing up with, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, uh, the Raspberry Reich, the main character in that, uh, has a baby, they're also very into sort of, you know, sexually charged, they have a baby at the end of the film. That, and their baby grows up and you have some sort of a crossover movie like Freddy vs. Jason, but sexual liberation babies battling each other or something. What do you oh, think of these things? Like... Yes. Um, just looking it up. Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, that is in fact the uh, plot that I, I... I mean, it is going to be about the daughter, yes, uh, if we do a sequel. Excellent. Possible sequel <laughs> to Preaching to the Reverted, everyone. You heard yes. it here live. Well, yes. not really live. And if it happens, I will review it for you. I will review the fuck out of it because it would be an honor. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Now, um, we're going to move on to uh, another one of your films. Uh, but beforehand, I'm going to explain uh, my own personal history with this film. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I know I've told you this already, Stuart, so this is for the audience. Um, this film is called Revelation, and it's, uh, you know, it's based around christian sort of stories and you know mythology etc etc and i was a while back i was doing a review series for the apocalypse quadrilogy now there are four apocalypse films the second one is called revelation so i just went on to ebay or amazon and just looked up every film i could find called revelation to try and find the one that was right and i accidentally bought stewart's film revelation which has a similar ish storyline but it's made much better so I accidentally watched the better Revelation sort of movie, and yours is much better than the other one. Thank you. And so you realise what, what that Terence Stamp didn't look much like Jeff Fahey. Was that was that? The, that's <laughs> yeah. When you realised it took me about twenty five minutes to realise. I don't think this is the right one. <laughs> yeah. What's Terence Stamp doing walking around? In the, uh, well, yes, um, that that seems quite good. Story. Although the the Antichrist the Antichrist. Uh, between the two, the Apocalypse films, between the first and second, which is Apocalypse and Revelation, he gets, the actor does get replaced. And he's supposed to be a, a charismatic European guy. And I have to say, Udu Kerr would have been a much better choice for them for their sequels. Yeah. Yeah. He did appear in Omega Code, didn't he? Which was, um, you know, a sort of. Um, made yeah. It I'm pretty, yeah, I've seen the Omega Code films. I'm pretty sure he was in the first one, although the, it's the second Omega Code film, which is the masterpiece, you know, Brian Trenchard Smith not giving a fuck. It was brilliant. <laughs> I must say it. Uh, I think I only saw the first one, but you oh, know, the... I wanted to see Udo and it was similar material, but um, I ought to check it out. Yeah, the, the second one, because you know at the end of the first Omega Code, the Antichrist is defeated. Yeah. But the second one, it starts off with the origin of the Antichrist, and you think they're doing like a prequel, but then yeah. they keep going and they just retell the story of the first one, but much more ludicrous because you've got <laughs> the Antichrist is still Michael York, but he, his brother is Michael Bean, who's the president of the United States, and then the the Battle of Armageddon is fought by Michael Bean just with with a rifle, you know, killing the devil when like it is CGI. In it's it's amazing. She's yeah. seen pretty much every Revelation movie ever. Yeah, I, I have a thing about sort of these Christian End Times movies. I don't know why. I mean, uh, I don't know. You know, I haven't really kept up with the genre um, other than the fact that I, I, at that time that I made that film, it was it was uh, before um, Dan Brown book had come out in UK and US. And I, I was interested in some of the similar themes and, of course, had read a lot of the similar kind of uh, speculative history. Um, so it, it was of interest to me, and, and I think that kind of parallel history or uh, mystical film is, is a very interesting genre where, where um, you know, you don't have to have, be actually a sort of believer in, 
in anything actually to find them interesting yeah uh, or a conventional believer and i think that uh, okay there are probably too many of them and of course once the the uh dan brown you know stuff started coming out as a big hollywood movie um then you know the cat was out of the bag but but um uh it was great going to these real places and finding that in malta for example the famous cathedral there uh, the Knights of St. John were well into occult symbolism and stuff that was just fantastic, you know, real alchemy. But it's not all, um, you know, it, it, there's some real, real occult that went on uh, as part of that kind of mythology and history that, that was very fascinating. Yeah, it, it's, um, I really wish that my DVD copy had more sort of behind the scenes footage or, uh, you know, information about the what went oh, on. You know? Oh, so you didn't have the one we had with it, because the edition we brought out had like five little films all about the occult history in it. Oh, did you get like an American version or something? I think I might have. It's, yeah, uh, I have, done. the oh, version oh, I have is pretty bare bones. Oh, what a shame, you know. Uh, although I know it did very well on DVD in America, uh, it's really surprising that therefore they, the reason it did well was because Dan Brown had come out, <laughs> the, book, the book had come out, his first book, and Therefore, everyone rushed to see the DVD of this film, which was the only thing you could get dealing with similar, you know, um, a view of, of the Bible history and, and, and uh, codes and that kind of thing. So um, it was uh, a bit odd that they released it without all the careful extras that we made that were about, you know, little documentaries about sacred geometry and mm. the, the village. Um, uh, Ren La Chateau, you know, what, what was really, you know, what really went on there. So, so that's a shame, but anyway, there you are, it's interesting. Well, my copy is unfortunately on the other side of the Atlantic, so I can't really confirm what version it is, but yeah, it's pretty bare bones. But, um, so everyone about, if you want to see a good film called Revelation, check out Stuart's version, it came out a couple of years after the Jeff Fahey one, um, it's, it's available out there. Get the British copy though, it has better stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you made a couple of documentaries about some members of your family. Um, Tuvashish, I'm Not Dead, and um, having a brain fart about what the name of the one about your but uncle is called. My Unbeatable Uncle. That was... Uh, it. Yeah, but it's a documentary. I've been a long time finishing it. Yeah. All, I, all I really know about these projects is the couple of small things I found online, and uh, they both sound really, really fascinating. Could you just go into a big spiel just explaining about them and possibly where you can find them, you know, uh, Tavashi's I'm Not Dead because it, it was made several years ago, so I'm hoping yeah. it's got a DVD release. Well, yes. Uh, look, what it was, I, I, I was, my uh, father and my uncle in the Second World War were the sole survivors of their family. The family were living in an area that got occupied first by the Soviets, at the beginning of the war and then the Nazis invaded and being a Jewish family they were all killed uh, with the exception of my father who had been shipped off to the Russian camps by that stage the Gulag for trying to escape from Soviet occupation and my uncle who was only 15 at the time my father 23 uh, who had rushed off to join the partisans got sick and got evacuated so the two films look at their own amazing survival stories because my father later escaped from the Soviet camps or KGB captivity several times. And in the documentary about my father, I went back to uh, when the Soviet Union fell to find evidence of what his amazing survival had been because he wrote a book about it, Tavares, I'm Not Dead, the same title. That was a bestseller in the early 80s in the Cold War. And some people didn't believe what he was saying. But well, we went back and we got the actual KGB file, the actual pictures, his mugshot, his case number, all this stuff, and confirmation that he'd escaped from a, an Arctic camp. And so, you know, that was what the documentary was over many years, tracing his incredible story. And after he died, investigating with it, Possibly he was some kind of Soviet James Bond agent, which could have explained some of the things that he couldn't explain in his life about his escapes. And, uh, and yeah, my, my uncle was, um, after the war, he came back after they liberated that area that the family were from, was in 
modern day Ukraine. And he was desperate to see his family. Of course, they then discovered that everyone was dead. He went to the sister's home uh, and was told at the door when he found it empty that uh, a neighbor said, I know, I'm t I've got to tell you, your, your sister survived the war with her child, but was just being shot by this collaborator, and she gave him the name. And he hunted down that collaborator oh. and several other Nazis and collaborators. Yikes. You got... See, now, yeah, I really do want to find this document. This sounds very interesting. Yeah. Well, Tavarish, I'm Not Dead, is out. It's been out for several years. It, got, it had some nice awards and... Uh, uh, got nominated for the British Independent Film Awards and the Grierson Award. At that time, there was no BAFTA for Best Documentary, but um, we had many awards and we were at the uh, Museum of Modern Art Documentary Fortnight in New York and various other places. You can see it on iTunes. Uh, it's Tovarish, T-O-V-A-R-I-S-C-H. I am not dead. And it is on iTunes. The other film, well, we're hoping to bring out soon, but been a long time in post for various reasons. Well, I know I personally have been I've been wanting to see them for quite a while. Well, I have iTunes, so we can watch later. Oh, excellent. Well, you, we've just worked out what we're going to do this evening. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's uh, it sounds like it's a terribly heavy film, and it is heavy. It does deal with terrible, but there's a lot of laughs. And Emma McFarland such an amazing character that people are amazed by by how amusing he is at times. And... If it's okay to, to ask you about this, uh, from my reading online about the, the films, mm. um, what was it like being arrested by the by the Russians uh, for, for making a movie? Well, I, we got arrested twice. Once when my father was alive by the Uzbek security service, who uh, I had been informed, I think before, maybe after, actually have boiled people alive. Um, and I, I, you know, I didn't really... Uh, it wasn't really funny, but what was funny was ha how my father got us out of trouble by just barking at them and saying, do you realise who I am? I know you're president. And they said, OK, prove it. And he, he produced the telephone number of the president and we got out. Wow. And I asked later, so, so was that his phone number? They said, yeah. And do you know him? He said, no. Nope. <laughs> he did have his direct line, which was the way that we got out of the <laughs> the Uzbek security service, who, who are really still notorious, and it's still the same president, I think. And the Russian one was in Moscow filming in Red Square, where about my father after he was dead. And I've been told that if you didn't put the tripod down on the camera, you had the right to film. But this didn't interest the Interior Ministry police who, who, were, who arrested me and said that I was going to be uh, banned from Russia for five years and to find $2,000. And eventually they settled for a lesser bribe and, and we ran away. We ran away after they'd, I'd confused them about what the, what the value of the British pound was, which they thought was worth many times more than the dollar. So I got out with about 40 quid, I think. The value. <laughs> and, and yeah, we, once we were around the corner, we ran. Ah, uh, yet again, you've got a, a real life story that would make a really good movie by itself. <laughs> well, I don't know, but there's probably loads of people who have legitimately trying to make a simple journalistic or documentary story that have, have worse experience, I'm sure. It's a good story to tell at a cocktail party. So what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a filmmaker. Oh, that's interesting. Well, there was that time that we did escape the KGB, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. But um, we'll move on to uh, May I Kill You, your uh, your latest film that's come out, and, uh, and a film that I was really, really happy to see in advance. So... Where did you get the idea for a serial killing bicycle cop just running around killing people and then using social media? Right. I started the idea was what, I, you know, as I get older, I find that I'm often around dawn in this sort of um, uh, kind of dreamy state, you know, where I think of films. Sometimes they're terrible ideas. Sometimes they're good. Or sometimes I can't really formulate the idea, but I just sort of meditate on it for months in a semi-dreamy state. But I just had the idea of what if videos appeared on the Internet? And the, the victims of a killer agreed with it, you know. And so I, I, I'm interested, as you can tell from my other films, probably in kind of the fantasy and absurd side of, of, of the world or crime. And, you know, I, I wasn't really interested in a straight vigilante killer type, you know, serial killer film. Um, and hadn't actually done anything on serial killers before. But I thought, well... What it really is, is exercising self-delusion by the killer. 
And let's let's go into the mind of one of these killers who sadly, you know, so often we get these people who they either kill for a cause or they're lust killers or you know, combination of thereof. Um, and uh, yeah, I started really reading about all these terrible people and, and that actually found that some of them were quite funny. Um, black humour, um, did some really funny things, could also be very kind, several uh, really nasty serial killers were capable of actual kindness, you know, some were big charity donors, some ran the uh, uh, Ted Bundy, ran the Samaritans, you know, if he couldn't save a woman, he'd strangle her, you know, and um, and, and other people who were like just, you know, people don't realise how often serial killers are quite nice. So I, I thought, well, we'll make a nice bloke. And then I was just looking, since it was an exercise in the absurd, uh, what about the policeman is the perfect co cover for a killer, uh, as so often has happened? Uh, but, you know, and in Britain they don't have guns, so what's more silly than a policeman without a gun? It's a policeman on a bicycle without a gun. Uh, and the bicycles they ride here are called and made by Smith & Wesson. So that, that was the germ of the idea. It's like a ridiculous Smith & Wesson riding cop. Um, we, we, last night, actually, we saw something that might be more ludicrous than a, than a police officer on a bike. Do you want to explain, honey? Was it, which one? Oh, we were, yeah, we, were, we went, to this, um, went to this film festival in Baltimore. And yeah. um, we ha I live in Pikesville, so we had to, my GPS takes us through West Baltimore. And we saw these guys in vest pull out in front of us, and they were on three wheel scooters. Yes. And they, but they had police vests on, and so they were going really slow. And I didn't want to pass them, <laughs> even though it was a one way street, because I was like, "Can you get pulled over by the scooter police?" And finally, they turned left, and we just kept on going. So. <laughs> they do sound very funny. Oh yeah. Uh, They're Baltimore cops, so I didn't want to cause a fuss. <laughs> it's funny. Perhaps it's a shame they didn't encounter, sort of take down those. Two terrorist brothers on, on tricycles <laughs> would have been really, really <laughs> funny, really funny scene actually. Before they got and did any damage, would have been good. Yes, uh, for like a thematic sequel to uh, Four Lions. Yes, yeah, could be good, could it? Couldn't it? Send in the tricycle cops to <laughs> take them down, uh, and, and instead of the brother running over his brother, you know, you could have um, he he sees it's a tricycle and runs over his brother with the tricycle instead of with the car. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we've received death threats from the entirety of America. Amen. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I'm glad they got them. I'm just, just a shame it wasn't before, but anyway. Yeah. But the, um, personally, on uh, May I Kill You, very, very, very good film. I love the use of social media, how it permeated it. I can definitely see in about 20 years what you're doing there being a mainstay of, of filmmaking. Mm. As the, the as the average age of filmmakers, you know, people who, who grow up with social media, as they become, you know, filmmakers, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll put that into the into the, the DNA of the film. So Yeah, I think they will. It'll be sort of, yeah, I mean... Who knows what they'll invent, you know, kind of glasses where you watch the film through and other stuff. It'll all be embedded, I think. And, um, yes, I didn't answer your question to why it was social media. I mean, the reason that I chose social media was uh, I simply thought, well, um, serial killers have become a phenomenon, recognised phenomenon, since the age of the press. And, you know, from Jack the Ripper on, they have succeeded because they seek publicity. I don't think before that late Victorian era, the mass press, was there, uh, I mean, the term, of course, serial killers was inv invented way later, but, but um, you know, th that issue of the oxygen publicity, the hunger for publicity by the killer is now, I think, going to be multiplied many times over with the immediacy and rapidity and uh, universality of social media. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, three at least three killings, uh, killers, have been using those media uh, since I wrote the script. Sadly. Oh, I, I didn't hear about that. Well, you've got the first one was before we had even shot the film. In between me writing, it was Anders Breivik in Norway. Oh yeah. 
who Facebooked just before he went on the rampage and put his statements and ethos mm. out and everything else. Yeah. Then you had, um, uh, soon after that, was the uh, Mohammed Mira in Toulouse, who's, uh, who got his kicks killing uh, the rabbi and Jewish children and soldiers who'd served in, um, you know, who were off duty and who uh, were around the military base. And filmed it on his GoPro camera and sent it actually to Al Jazeera, who mercifully didn't show it. But um, that was his intention to, to have it. Uh, his 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 cohorts, his whoever his helpers were, they got intercepted also before they could upload. And um, the third one was uh, uh, Rocco Magnotta, who uh, sent body parts to Canadian government agencies. I think he. He sliced up a body of a gay lover. I remember said, hearing about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, this uh, this reptile um, had a, a pretty active Twitter account, which you can find, and um, and uh, enforce the law of our killer. Follows. He's the only person he follows, actually. Uh, but Rocco uh, Magnotta um, was caught, actually, going... He was caught because he was in an internet cafe in Berlin. Uh, you know, about his blog and brag about his exploits. Um, and uh, that's how they got him. Ah. Uh, so, yeah, he, he had uploaded it. It was live. The killing was live on webcam. It wasn't an upload. It was a live transmission. And it was actually on the internet for a very long time. I don't know if they've succeeded in taking it down, but it was very easily findable. Quite the most revolting, I think, of all the stuff that I had to watch for the film. Um, but that, I certainly uh, found that, that pretty grueling to watch. Yeah, I can believe it. We've been going for just over um, half an hour. So if we roll over to uh, talking, going back to Preaching to the Perverted, so we can talk about the Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay. Well, this film, um, Preaching to the Perverted, that was, uh, when it first came out, it was it was hailed by a lot of the kind of fashion, gay, and music press. They loved it. The conventional press mostly hated it, although there were some good reviews and uh, uh, said, you know, this, they just dismissed it. This film, 16 years on, has been become the first, certainly the first European film to be restored and remastered by its fans on social media of crowdfunding and that's on the kickstarter site there may have been other ones on indiegogo i don't know but certainly only a couple of i think american smaller films and some documentaries had been done before us we became i believe the first european film to achieve that uh, by just appealing to the fans that look you know we don't have the film in hd the 35 mil meg is is, is uh, in danger of being thrown away because it's high storage costs and needs to be restored anyway. The pictures, the oxide of the magnetic tape, the sound masters is decaying. And so, incredibly, uh, they've supported the film. We've passed our target by uh, 125%. Um, we uh, don't make any money out of it uh, because it's quite an expensive process, but it is... Uh, still available for people who'd love to just get a digital download or other interesting rewards like dinner with a dominatrix or all kinds of interesting uh, and crazy rewards are available and some of them uh, you know on the, uh, at very reasonable prices some are crazy prices and some people have paid crazy prices to have yeah. them, so. You had some uh, some props from the film for available um, including yep. the the mannequin which personally I would have loved that, that yeah, was really cool. um, we, you know, he'd sat by my desk for 15, 16 years of writing, and my wife said, look, we've got to, you know, we're going to be downsizing soon, and this is deep fluttering he's got to go, and he's become like a pet, I just couldn't bear to throw him away, I mean, after all, he was kind of animating the film and got kind of this amazing reaction when he was tortured as a cyber voodoo doll by his mistress online, yep. in other words, his owner. For those who haven't seen the film, his owner, when the mistress uh, wags, you know, sort of tortures the doll by waggling its penis and other things, the man who, who's the avatar um, online is receives electric shocks in those areas. And of course, this was night we shot it in 1996. To, to people at that point, the 
the, the idea was so outlandish that, you know, people couldn't, some people couldn't even understand the scene, you know, saying, why is this doll being tortured and the man online, you know, some, in some other location receives electric shocks. So, anyway, the doll has been sold for £425. Uh, he needs a bit of leg surgery. His leg has become detached, but I'm sure he'll be well restored by our prop master. And, yeah, we, we sold him. Uh, Guinevere Turner has been sold for a meal in Los Angeles. I have been sold six times. Uh, I've, got to, I've got to do a lot of dinners now. Um, oh, there, there are worse things to be sold yeah, for. It's great that the fans have paid for it. It's nice. I mean, uh, we host the dinner. So, um, and we're going to have a premiere at uh, the remastered film at London's BAFTA, British Academy, uh, which will probably be the most unusual premiere they've had, as I think will be largely a fetish crowd. Um, so, yeah, I just hope it doesn't end up with the police being called like the premiere we had in Leicester Square in '97. We can hope. Although that would make it. Although if that does happen, record it. It can be extra features yes. of the DVD. Yeah. yeah, you're right. The good extra, like we had. Um, they're on the extra, the original DVD. Actually, the the police um, coming up. You know, to trying to close the show because we were over with the the Prince Charles Cinema was uh, over. You know, somehow overbooked it. I don't know how. <laughs> the um. For the for the Kickstarter for the advertising for it, did you consider reaching out to groups such as uh, Bizarre Magazine or anything like that? Yeah, Bizarre tomorrow I think are launching a big support um, thing for the film uh, competition where you can win, um, I believe, a gladiator costume to be made to measure for you. Ah, oh, uh, great! Uh, leather one by Max Kane, who is also repairing our our uh, Max Kane dot com dot com with a K who is repairing our cyber voodoo doll. And uh, yeah, it's a 500 pound costume and other prizes signed, Blu-rays, this, that, the other, that you can win if Bizarre go live with that. I hope they do uh, in the next couple of days. Um, so that'd be nice. So yeah, Bizarre really supported the film at the beginning and they also supported my latest film, uh, May I Kill You, which is nice, because you know, they, I think it's just good that they did. I mean. It, can't expect you know some critics like not like one film you do not the other but bizarre you know they were pretty solid so audience even though they have reached the kickstarter um the threshold for getting the remastering done when I, all the money that is donated on top of that will pay for some sort of an interesting extra feature and so yes they call keep... them stretch goals and uh this is means that for example we'll be able to do subtitles in more languages do much meatier sound not just a restoration of the sound, but a complete re-recording and remixing of uh, of the sound, which is going to be really exciting in 5.1. It was originally just stereo. Yeah, and uh, if you get enough, then uh, possibly we might be able to try to get me to do my uh, my review, put for the next feature, something like that. Yeah, so we'd keep donating. Great. Uh, it'd be great to have a critics commentary. If we, you know, we never know. We might we often get a last minute surge. And if we hit our next stretch goal, then we might be able to afford that too, which would be fantastic. So everybody get out there and be a part of it. I know uh, a lot of our community are really big on uh, crowdsourcing and uh, to help fund stuff like that. So yeah. seriously, guys, this time we mean it. Yeah, yeah even a pound is, is good. You know, we're very grateful for any any contribution. It's it's a worthy film to support. You can tell your grandchildren, I hope you support that. Thank I you. I mastered it. You're probably the only critic who's called it worthy, but that's great, you know. It's time to food on, you know. Uh, so that's that's good. Good to hear that word. Well, uh, we um now the copy I have of Preaching to the Perverted on DVD is from Region One or Region Zero. Can't really recall. It's got the Guinevere's signature on it. Ah, yes, that will be the uh, the U.S. Guinevere Turner signature edition. That's right. Because I, I. I seem to recall when I bought my copy, I had great trouble finding a Region Two version. Is uh, was I was I looking in the wrong places? The, 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 uh, we did the collector's edition as Region Zero. Uh, uh, it is an NTSC picture that we watch anywhere around the world, and that is the collector's edition with um, uh, quite a lot of extras. You may have had the same mm -hmm. ones, but this had my commentary on, not Green's and uh, Green did her own for the US as a second release. Uh, it was, the original one released in the US would have been like our collector's edition with different artwork. Okay. So, 
So um, yeah, and soon there'll be another edition with the with the remastered one. Yeah, and the remastered one, I'm guessing, will be Region Zero, able to be watched anywhere. So anyone could donate, could buy a copy afterwards, you know, whatever. Yeah, there will be. That's right. We'll do them to special order. Um, not sure how long they'll be available though, because we may not be able to mass produce the DVD. Um, but certainly, there will be HD availability of the film and all media, you know, and Blu-rays. But we might not mass produce the DVD. Hopefully, you'll get enough to at least support a, f- a few hundred. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, and I think we can we can cope with that. I honestly, I'm very excited about the proposition of there being a sequel to Preaching to the Perverted. Thank you. Thank you. You got our support, so. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, and, and all the best, and thanks so much for the time. Okay, and uh, thanks for coming on, Stuart.